recording of last week on Blackboard. So you should be able to see that. It, it is a YouTube video that I plugged into Blackboard. It already has closed captioning. So it's an accessible video. If you wanna you know, um, refresh your memory about what we talked in the first class or any of the classes um, or any of the lectures, I will be putting up the video lectures on Blackboard uh, throughout the semester. So, all right. So this is where we stopped in the last class. We were talking about emojis and I said, that one of the crucial things about language is that language is hierarchical in structure. When you talk about gestures or emojis, they're not necessarily hierarchical. As you can see from the example um, on, on your screen, this is a linear structure of an emoji. It really doesn't have the same kind of hierarchy that um, language has. So that's where I kind of ended. So let's move ahead. So, We've kind of started talking about English and you know other kinds of languages. And the technical term that we use for this is natural language. Uh, so there are natural languages, but there are also um, languages that programmers and computer scientists use. Uh, so those are not natural languages. Those are computer languages such as Python and R. Uh, so, so that's really where this terminology is coming from. A natural language is a language that is spoken by uh, 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 some speakers in a particular community or society, right? So examples of natural language include English and Spanish and um, you know all the other languages that are spoken in the world. Uh, but we already saw that there are also languages like sign language, which does not have a spoken uh, component to it. Uh, and we also saw that sign language can itself be so varied and so diverse, just like natural language. So you can have 200 different sign languages, depending on uh, what society you're part of, what community you're a part of. So, so there's natural languages, there's sign languages, and there's emojis. But one other kind of language that you know, uh, I mentioned in, that you're going to be doing a final project on this, but we really haven't talked about it is constructed languages, right? So there's natural language that kind of evolved in societies and communities by a series of speakers. And then there's constructed languages. And these are languages that were actually constructed by people like you and me, right? By linguists. So let's look at what a constructed language is. A constructed language is very similar in function to a natural language, except that the context for which that constructed language was created is very different from the natural language. So here is a very uh, you know, well-known example of a constructed language. This is Klingon. Uh, do you all know what uh, enterprise Klingon was created for? Anybody? Like Star Trek the Big Enterprise? Bang Theory? The, uh, Arlen says Big Bang Theory, <laughs> that's not right. That's a good <laughs> guess. <laughs> Star Trek? Uh, Kelly? Star Trek? Star Trek, yes, yeah, Star Trek, right? But Klingon is just so famous. I mean, you know, I see the reference that Arnold was pointing to, the Big Bang Theory, but Klingon is so famous that you, you actually have Shakespeare translated into Klingon, right? It's, that, that's, that's how famous Klingon is. It's, the, it's kind of like the mother of constructed languages, if you will, right? Um, so here are two phrases in Klingon. The first one is kamusha, right? Kamusha, and that is how you say, I love you in Klingon. So if you wanna use that with your partner or anybody you wanna use a kamusha is how you say, I love you in Klingon. And the other phrase, and I think I have a video, uh, audio recording of that. Let me. I'm going to play that again. Right? No kane. No kane. Uh, any guesses on what no kane means in Klingon? Uh, I happen to know. Okay. Nuk ne means. What are you doing? <laughs> it's basically how they say hi. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, do you watch Star Trek a lot, Landon? Yes, I also have a comprehensive um, grammar of Klingon oh. sitting on my bookshelf back there. <laughs> oh, that will be useful when you create your own constructed language. So have that ready with you. So see, you can you can 
you know, steal things like that from the library. Ab Abla Library has a lot of resources uh, for creating your own constructed language. So, you know, uh, a comprehensive grammar of Klingon would be really useful for your final project. So, yeah, thanks for bringing that up, Landon. We will talk a lot more about Klingon in weeks five and six. So uh, I just wanted to kind of mention uh, about Klingon and then move on. Okay. So we all speak a language, right? But do you happen to remember when you started speaking language as a baby? So I want you to kind of think back, close your eyes and think back to what your first memory of language was. It might not be easy to remember, but try to go back in time and think Does anything come to your memory? Do, do you remember what your first word was? Or maybe it was, uh, you know, um, something that your mom or dad told you uh, to kind of say that you said dad first or mom first or something like that, you know? Um, anything, anything that comes back to you? This is Kelly. Yes. Um, I, I don't have any memory of the first language instance I had, but my parents did tell me that my first word or utterance was dada. Okay, dada. Yeah, that, that's very often the case that um, across, um, you know, nations and across different languages, the very first word that a lot of children actually say is dada, um, you know, even if it's not English. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of moms are unhappy about that. <laughs> so... <laughs> You know, uh, anybody else who remembers what their first word was? Maybe data, maybe something else. This is Olivia. Um, I don't remember even what like my mom or dad told me my first word was, but my first sign was milk. I do remember. I don't remember that, but I do know that about myself, which makes sense. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No. Um, a lot of people actually, uh, you know, uh, teach sign language to babies just because, you know, they pick it up so much quicker than uh, spoken language, because when you're a baby, your uh, vocal cords and, you know, everything that is needed, the apparatus that is needed to create language or produce language doesn't happen until you're like one year old. Right. But you really want to talk before that. So uh, milk, right. A sign for milk. Uh, and more and more, right? Um, so my my daughter, who's now three and a half, her first word was milk as well. And she was six months old and she would sign milk to me when she wanted to drink milk. Um, and my son, who's 16 months old now, even when he wants more food, he says more and more, but he also adds the sign along with that. He's like, okay, mom's not understanding. Let me sign and say more and more because it's like, I really want food, but you're not listening to me. So I think he thinks of it as like as emphasis, right? Like give me more food, like now. <laughs> so yeah, so a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of babies I think start signing before they speak. Anybody else? And this is Niall. I also don't remember, um, but I know my mom and my family told me that I took a really, really long time to start talking and that like, I didn't really, <clears throat> cry or anything for a while but they said that when I did start talking I just like started talking like an adult and going around and like you know just and I mean and my little siblings I have a four-year-old brother and eight-year-old sister that are my mom's kids and they do that too and they will you know walk around and like she said like, I just have like the vocabulary of an adult and like I argued back but not like you know in a ridiculous way but just like a matter of fact yeah so that's what I know about how i start when I started speaking, but I don't know what my first word was. She said it just, I just started talking and just kept going and yeah. never stopped. <laughs> yeah, that's the other fascinating thing about language, right? I mean, even if there's so much variability about when babies start saying their first word and start speaking, th there are developmental patterns. So, you know, even if you're a late talker, you catch up pretty quickly. So we don't observe uh, developmental delays in uh, babies as much as we do with, you know, like later adults who lose language capabilities because of like stroke or an accident and things like that. So that's, that, that, that's a very uh, a fascinating point that you brought up, Nayel. 
Um, I actually do have a memory of my first word because it was not mama or dada. Um, I grew up in India in the 80s um, and we had, you know, we had only black and white television back then. Um, and even the television was like, you know, it, it came from the British, you know, the era. So it was a really old, gigantic looking thing. Um, and we only had black and white television. We only had one channel, which was an Indian channel, because at that point we had, an, you know, globalization was not a thing. So we had not opened up to channels from outside um, India. Um, and there was an ad that used to play all the time. And there was a, it, it was a girl and she used to keep twirling around. It was an ad for a detergent actually, but the, but the name of the detergent was Nivea, right? And so she would twirl around and say, washing powder, Nivea, washing powder, Nivea. And so I used to love that rhyme so much because it was musical. And I think I really, you know, um, attached to that music. So I, I actually said Nivva or something like that, Nimma or something like that, trying to imitate that particular word. And I think my mom was like, you're not saying mom or dad, but you know, you're imitating what that girl is saying in the, in the TV, because it was just so fascinating to me, right, uh, as a child. So, so yeah, that, that's my first memory of language, uh, partially aided, thanks to my mom. Uh, so yes, so when did you speak your first word? It's really difficult to say when you spoke your first word because we just don't have, you know, a clear cut memory unless your mom and dad remembers when your first word was, but it's typically around six months to one year, right? So that's the kind of period in which uh, a lot of babies actually speak their first word. So yeah, a lot of you, you know, uh, it, it could have been dada or mama, right? Most likely. And now I want you to think about how difficult or easy was it to go from that creating that first word to creating your first few sentences? Do you have any memory of you know, how you went from just speaking data, mama, uh, like putting two um, morphemes together and creating like bigger sentences? Any, any memories on that? Again, that's not easy, it's not, an easy memory, but usually you start saying your first sentence around three years old, three and a half, right? Um, sometimes early, there's a lot of variability again. But the point that I'm trying to drive home is that we, we talk so effortlessly, right? But as a baby, it's not easy, right? Because there's just so much uncertainty and there's so much learning that's happening. And nobody's teaching your language at that age. The first language lesson that you receive is when you're in what first grade maybe right not even right and the, the the first language lesson that you have in a second language is I think in fifth grade right in middle school so you know you're you're like by then you've already learned language uh, quite a bit so you know this number is quite a tricky number because I, I don't think anybody really knows how many languages there exist in the world but if you ask a linguist this is kind of like the ballpark that we talk about there are approximately 7,000 languages in the world right um, that would seem like a lot of languages but every minute as we speak languages are dying right so there's a lot of languages that have um, you know completely uh, become endangered and extinct in northern America uh, a lot of Native American languages. Um, so in 2016, when I joined Wichita State, I still remember in October of 2016, um, the last speaker of Wichita, um, the tribe that the city is named after, uh, passed away. And so he was the last remaining speaker and nobody else speaks Wichita. So that it's, it's, it's a dead, extinct language. Um, there are grammar books and you know, there are people who have tried to preserve the language. University of Colorado Boulder has a huge project to preserve Wichita and you know, they have dictionaries and um, recordings of the language and all that, but it's not a language that is actively passed on. Um, and for a language to be actively passed on, you need to have native speakers of the language, right? Um, so, you know, there, there are a lot of languages um, that that die every second, every day. So 7,000 is just a ballpark. It could be 9,000, it could be 5,000, right? We, we really don't have an estimate of how many languages there are. The other issue with knowing how many languages there are has to do with politics. So sociopolitical reasons, um, because a lot of, um, you know, the divide between what a language is and what a dialect of the languages is a very tricky line, 
right? Uh, very often, these decisions are not made by language experts or linguists, they're made by politicians. And it, it's very often gerrymandering and vote banking that's actually determining, you know, all these kind of decisions. So, so my point is that, you know, it, it's, it's a good number to have in theory, but really we have no idea how many languages that exist. But the fascinating thing for me as a linguist, when I, um, you know, um, discovered linguistics and I decided that I want to be a linguist is that even though there are 7,000 languages in the world, every child picks up a language, every healthy child picks up a language, whether it's a sign language, whether it's a spoken language, that, that, that is fascinating, right? There is no human child, no healthy human child who doesn't speak a language given the variability and the number of languages that exist. This is the fascinating bit, if you ask me, about linguistics. Why is it fascinating? Because we know so little about how language works. We all speak language effortlessly, right? We have no memory of how we picked up language and how we speak English, but we do it so effortlessly and so beautifully, right? I mean, you and I, Today, if I ask you to write poetry, I'm pretty sure that all of you can write really good poetry, right? Um, that's using language in a very creative way, maybe even creating sentences that you've never heard before, or even creating new words that, you know, and giving them new meaning and, you know, using words in a new way, et cetera. And that's the biological mystery that linguists have been trying to solve for, you know, years and centuries, right? What is language? Why is language a biological mystery? Why does every healthy human child pick up language? We don't know. But the fascinating thing about language is that when I am speaking language, you are understanding everything that I'm saying. You're just doing it like that, right? You're not thinking, you're not, you're not you know, struggling to understand me. You're not saying, oh yeah, that, that's, you're just doing it. It's, it's all happening in your cognition. It's computation. It's all this wiring up here in your cognition. And it's fascinating because it happens so quickly, right? I am a fast talker. You know, I, 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 people have told me in the past that you talk really quickly. My students have told me in the past. And I, you know, I, I do, I go like da 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 because of my first language, my first language, Malayalam, we speak really fast. So I kind of, you know, it, it comes into my English. So. Also, my point is that at any point, if you want to stop me and say, can you repeat what I said? I'm happy to do that. But my point is that, you know, even if I'm speaking so quickly, you're still understanding everything that I'm saying because your brain and cognition is just processing everything that happens. So here is an illustration of what I just said. And I know if you were sleeping, now you're woken up. What do you see? What, what do you see on your screen? Have you seen this before? Maybe you have, yes, some of you have. What do you see? What, what, do you see things static? Do you see things moving? This is Ellie. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. To me, it's very psychedelic, <laughs> um, but it also looks like um, the circles that have the red like a split tongue coming out of them looks uh -huh. like coiled up snakes yeah <laughs> yeah this is actually called the uh, the rotating snake solution that's the that's the official name of it so you you caught on to that to that you know the snake's tongue coming out yeah trinity i think you were gonna say something i was gonna say they look like they're moving but if i focus on one circle then it just it stays static mm -hmm. yeah yeah so so when you just look at, you know, the screen, it's moving, it's it's rotating, right? That's why it's called the rotating snake solution. None of the circles are moving, right? None of the circles are moving. It is just an illusion in your head. But the thing about this illusion is that you cannot not see it, right? I cannot tell you, do not look at those moving circles. They're still moving. I mean, you know, you can't, Pretend that they're not moving, but it's your brain doing it. This is called a visual illusion. 
another classic example of a visual illusion that uh, went viral a couple of years ago was the black and blue dress, if you remember that. Uh, yeah, so a lot of people saw the dress as black and blue, a lot of other people saw it as, I think it was golden and white or something like that. And there was a huge debate about what actual color the dress was that's a visual illusion as well. So the thing about visual illusion, just like languages, you simply do it. You just don't have a choice, right? With language, just like with visual illusions, your brain is just so capable of producing language. And we think in language, we dream in language. Um, to go back to the point that uh, Landon made in the last class, even just emojis, they, they, you know, we think and name them and label them in language, right? It just, we just cannot, you know, undo that. Okay, I want you all to close your eyes and I'm gonna read out a sentence and I just want you to close your eyes and listen to the sentence, okay? Ready? Cherry's jubilee on a white suit, wine on altar cloth. Apply club soda immediately and it works beautifully to remove the stains from the fabric. Okay, you can open your eyes now. Yeah, look at the sentence that I just read. This is uh, from a novel, um, but you know, as you can see, there's a lot of you know different kind of words in there. There's a lot of different kinds of sentences in there. Now, what just happened when I asked you to close your eyes and listen to this? What happened in your head? Did you think? Do you have an image of something? Or Kelly, I see that you want to say something. Yes, um, I imagined a person in a suit with the stain on the fabric. I imagined an altar cloth, like maybe on a, an altar with a wine stain on it. And then I also could picture um, putting the, the, the stain remover on it to remove the stains. So it was all images to me. Right, it was all visual, right? Anybody else who also saw uh, a visual representation of what I said? Um, Olivia here. For me, when you read it the first time, I just pictured the words, like kind of as you were saying them. Um, and then when Kelly was describing it, then that's when I could really see the image because I had time to like, like slow down and imagine it a little bit. Yeah. So what happened was I put a thought in your head. My instructions in the previous slide was clear. I didn't say imagine, right? I just said, close your eyes and listen, right? But what I did was I put a thought in your head and I didn't do this with magic or by, you know, uh, you know, waving my invisible wand. I did this by just moving my mouth, right? And making sounds, right? And the thinking was so automatic, just like how Kelly said, like Kelly described it, you know, it was all visual. It, she just couldn't help it, right? Her brain started creating those images and was completely automatic, right? You couldn't help but think of that image when I was reading that sentence out. And it was an incredibly specific thought because it was a very incredibly specific uh, paragraph that I picked from that book. And you've probably never heard that sentence before or the paragraph before, and you've never probably thought about a man in a white suit with a, you know, a stain and an altar cloth. Uh, so it's something that is completely new and novel and unique, right? Uh, completely never heard before, never seen before. But this is a completely new piece of information that I put in your head by just moving my mouth. And that is the uniqueness of human language. It's Unlike any other form of communication, we've been talking a lot about how language is communication, about how language is, you know, similar to animal communication. But I'm going to tell you that there are two different ways in which human language is very different from animal communication systems, such as bird songs or primate communication uh, or the communication of the bees when they dance to uh, find honey. And the two ways in which it's completely different from animal communication systems is in terms of the kind of information that we can convey. So the kind of paragraph that I just read to you, that's so much detail, so much information that no animal can ever communicate something with that much of information and that much of detail. It's just impossible for them to do that. They do not have the vocabulary. They do not have the grammar. They do not have the means to do it. 
all right? And the second is in terms of the combinatoric system that we have. So let me um, explain what the combinatoric system is. Let me open up a whiteboard. Okay, so a combinatoric system is basically when you have, um, I can easily explain it with um, compounding. So when you take two different words and you blend it and create a compound word, we, so there's out and there's side and you create outside and you can see that the meaning of outside is directly related to the meaning of out and side, right? You understand the meaning of outside from, you know, combining those two different word themes together. But if, for example, I could take side and out and create side out, which I can because there's no word called side out. You can see that the meaning of side out would be different from the meaning of outside because of the way in which I combine the different morphemes. So in outside, I've taken out and side and in side out, I've just reversed it. But just by reversing it, you can see that the meaning completely changes, right? If this was a, a proper word of English, it's not, but you can you know, kind of comprehend what the meaning of side out could be. Right. And so this is what we mean by the combinatoric systems. Natural language has a combinatoric system that human that animal communication does not have. It's not hierarchical in the same way that um, human language is hierarchical. All right. Any questions so far? Feel free to interrupt me, like I said, just, you know, while I'm talking, just feel free to interrupt me if you have a question. You don't have to wait until the end of class. So the question to, to all this is, how do we do this? How do humans effortlessly speak language? What happens in our brain? What happens in our cognition when we're making all these computations happen, when we speak English and when we speak another language and when we speak multiple languages and we you know, uh, go back and forth between languages? How is this all happening? Do we use memory? Do we memorize a ton of expressions? Is that, do you think that's how it's gonna work? What, what is the role of memorization um, in language and language acquisition? I think when you're learning a new language, you like that's when I use memory the most because especially if there's like an idiomatic phrase or something like that, um, that's when I would use memory the most, but not maybe for just like my natural language. Yeah, so especially with, you know, uh, with Spanish, because, you know, I know a lot of you um, learn Spanish, you, you need to have a set of vocabulary, you need to, you know, have a certain memorization aspect, because obviously you're learning all this new vocabulary, and you're learning all these idiomatic phrases, etc. But what about first language? Let's keep aside second language for now. Um, let's talk about first language. What do you think? How do you speak a first language? Is it through memorization of tons of expressions? I mean, clearly there is some memorization because you know you do have a vocabulary, you probably have a lexicon with you know, a lot of different words listed with their um, you know, uh, meaning aspect. But if so, you, you know, the paragraph that I read for you, right? A sentence of uh, sentences that you've never heard before, you could still understand those sentences, that combination, right? Because, you know, you understood every single word and you put it together in that particular meaning and you've never heard that sentence before, right? So if it's just memorization, you shouldn't have been able to do that. So there's something much more to language than just memorizing expressions. And, you know, um, this is why a lot of second language, when you learn it, you don't learn it to the fluency that you, you know, see in a native speaker. Because the way that we're teaching second languages are completely different from the way you learn and speak a first language, right? So, so now you see how different it is, right? Uh, learning a second language from um, speaking a first language. So the answer to 
how do we do this? How do we speak language? What are the toolkits? Is what is going to be the rest of the semester? So in the first half, of what we are going to be doing, the first unit, we are going to look at the toolkits of linguistics. So we're going to look at the grammar, the principles that guide the production of language and how language and pieces of language are organized. And in the second half, we will discover what the connections of language are between um, all the different disciplines uh, that connect linguistics, um, such as anthropology and psychology and philosophy and math and computer science, etc. So that was where I was supposed to end last class. So any questions on this lecture slide before I move on to the next one? All right. Okay, so let's move on to today's lecture. Um, let's see. Okay. All right. So, oh, uh, can you see my screen? No. Okay. The sharing is fast. No? Uh, yeah, we can now. Okay. Let me, let me try it again. No? No? Oh. When I'm doing it full screen, it's some it, it's saying that sharing is paused. I'm not sure why. The second time you did it, it worked, but the first time no. Okay. Uh, something about me sharing. Maybe I'll just use this and it, can you still see it without the uh, the slide share uh, on? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just use it like this. So um, yeah, so I already put up chapter one on Blackboard. If you haven't seen it, uh, download it as a PDF um, and, you know, try to read it for next Tuesday. Again, like I said, the readings are not going to be too crucial for class. So if I say that you have to do a reading for today, but you, you know, you're unable to get to it, don't worry. I'm not going to ask you questions on the reading in class. It's always to supplement my lectures from class. So uh, Try to read it by next Tuesday, but again, if you need a little bit more time to finish the chapter, that's fine. You can take up until Thursday to finish it, but do read it because for your midterm, you might have questions from the reading. So, okay. All right, so this is what we just uh, talked about. Uh, that when we talk about language, language is a biological mystery, which is why we are really curious about language. We wanna know, you know, how do people speak language? Uh, because of the because of two things that make it fundamentally different from animal communication, um, the kind of information that we can convey with uh, human language and the combinatoric system um, of human language. And the question that we are going to ask in um, today's lecture, in this this particular lecture slide, is how do we actually speak a language? Let's talk about spoken language, right? How do we actually speak? Um, a language. And this is where we are going to talk about the different principles uh, that are, you know, guiding the production of language, uh, how we put language together, how we piece it together, and how we get the meaning aspect. And this is where we will talk about the toolkits of language analysis. So uh, the different uh, phonetic and uh, phonological uh, principles of language, the different morphological aspects of language, how do we put things together to create bigger words? How do we take words together and make bigger sentences, etc. So we still need to understand when we talk about the biological mystery of language, we still need to understand language in a much more general way. So let's start there. Let's try to see what, you know, uh, other people and other philosophers have talked about language. Uh, and then we will get into the toolkits of language. So let's start with a very basic concept. A lot of you might have seen this in other classes, uh, especially if you have taken like, you know, a Spanish class or a French class. Um, language consists of what we call signs, right? So what is a sign? A sign is an intersection or relationship of form and meaning. So very often there is this intrinsic connection between the form of a word or a phrase or 
um, uh, you know, any sign and the meaning aspect to it. So there's always these two parts. What is form? Form is always something concrete. So it's basically uh, writing um, such as, you know, um, what you write on uh, paper, uh, like the alphabet. Uh, or the sound, so the sound that comes out of your mouth when you pronounce that particular word or a gesture, right, in terms of sign language. And the meaning is the, the meaning aspect or the semantics behind that particular form. And that has to do with either, you know, um, um, what is in your lexicon, what is in the dictionary, uh, or something that is in that particular context. So a little bit more uh, pragmatic um, related, right? So let's see some examples of sign. Um, so here is an example of a sign. Um, this sign means infinity, right? And this sign means copyrighted. Now, the moment you see this sign on paper, you know that this means infinity. How is your brain processing that, right? So that's the biological mystery that we are talking about. Or when you see this copyrighted sign, you know that, okay, that means it's copyrighted, right? How are you connecting the sign, the, the form to the meaning? That's, that's what we are interested in um, in this class. Here are some more examples of sign. So when you see the heart symbol, that means love. And then you can see sign itself written in S-I-G-N in English, and it means an intersection or relationship of form and meaning, right? What are some of the features of signs? So do signs always have to be words, right? That's, that's the question that I think we need to ask. So not necessarily, right? Uh, not all signs are words. And signs are neither form nor meaning, but they're also simultaneously both. So all signs need to have that form aspect to it and that meaning aspect to it. Right, and very often it is because language uh, is is a series of signs that we say the language is used for communication. So it's because of that sign aspect, language is sign that we use language for uh, communication. Now, when you talk about communication, very often you talk about a third dimension of communication or a third dimension of sign, and that is the interpreter. Right, the interpreter. The reason is because there is no one-on-one -on -one mapping from form to meaning. It always has to go through the interpreter. So you have form that is interpreted by the interpreter and then you get the meaning. And the issue is that interpreter meaning is just so varied, right? Uh, I mean, there are 15 of you or 16 of you in, in, in this class and you can all think of yourself as the interpreter. Right? And what you're getting out of this lecture, each of you is going to be completely different, right? Because what I'm saying is the form, you are the interpreter, and then your brain is going to come up with the meaning, right? And that's why, uh, you know, in a lot of cases, communications break down, right? I mean, you very often say, oh, well, there was a miscommunication. What was that miscommunication? That miscommunication was a third dimension of the sign, which was the interpreter, right? And the, it is that interpreter that actually adds that aspect of variability, right? Because, you know, depending on people's sociocultural background, depending on people's uh, dialect of English uh, or dialect of language, uh, there could be different pragmatic interpretations and different contextual interpretations uh, for different forms and different uh, signs. And therefore, uh, not all phrases and not all words uh, map onto the same meaning. Uh, depending on that particular uh, interpreter and the variability encoded by the interpreter. So given that, that language is noisy and communication is noisy, let's start with a working definition of language. Language is a system of science, okay? That's what, that's what we are gonna use for this class, okay? Uh, let's say that language is a system of signs and it can be written or spoken, okay? I'm keeping aside sign language for now uh, because we will come back to sign language in unit two, but for the purposes of unit one, for the purposes of toolkits of linguistics, let's just take written and spoken language uh, for now, okay? And it's a system of signs. 
Charles Sanders Peirce, um, who, he was a, a French uh, philosopher. Um, and again, you might have, you know, um, read about him in uh, any of your French classes or semiotics class or something like that. Uh, he was the first one to actually say that, you know, um, language is a system of signs, and there are three different types of signs, according to uh, Peirce. Uh, the first one is an icon, the second is an index, and the third is a symbol. And I'm going to give you examples of each of these. Here are examples of signs that are icons, okay? What is a sign that is an icon? It is a sign whose form has actual characteristics of its meaning. So I've given you three examples over here. Uh, can you tell me what the first one is? What, 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 what symbol or sign is the first one? If you see this, do you know what to do? Is it the men's room? Yes, it is. It is the men's room, right? Uh, so this is, so basically it's a form that actually has characteristics of its meaning. Um, what about this second one? Is that Kansas? Kansas? That's Kansas, it's the state of Kansas, right? State of Kansas. I mean, nobody's gonna look at it and say that this is California, right? I mean, that, yeah. What about this, the last one? Curvy road ahead. Curvy road ahead, yes. So all these are signs that are icons, right? They actually have characteristics of its meaning. Unlike index, indexical signs are signs that only have meaning that are associated with that form, right? The form and meaning are associated in nature. So uh, here is uh, an example of a sign that is an index. Uh, There's a danger, right? But why is a skull, right, with two bones like that dangerous, right? We, we you know, that's just by association, right? Um, there's nothing about that skull that says this is danger. And uh, here's another indexical sign. So this is a sign for a restaurant. So you have a spoon and a fork. And uh, this means that, you know, if you're driving on the freeway and you see this, it means that there's restaurant and food ahead. Right, so food basically, uh, just because of the spoon and uh, fork. And the last one, do, do, do you have any idea what this road sign is? Could be snow or icy. Yeah, icy conditions ahead, right? So snow ahead, icy conditions ahead. So proceed with caution, right? But there's nothing inherently dangerous about a snowflake, right? I mean, you don't you know, you that proceed with caution that, you know, I see conditions ahead, that is just association uh, with that particular form and its meaning, right? There's nothing um, it, iconic about that particular uh, sign. And then there are um, signs that are symbolic. A uh, classic example of a sign that is symbolic is language, uh, because, uh, you know, as we all know, the sound systems that make up language and the spellings that make up language are completely arbitrary, right? So you have dog, so you have d, uh, and g, dog, then make up that dog, right, uh, in English. But that same word in uh, Spanish is perro, right, perro. Uh, so that's completely different. There's nothing, there's no d, there's no g, right? There's a p and a r right, uh, in Spanish. And then do you all know what that language is, the third language over here, which is also the word for dog, but any idea what that language is? Is that Amharic? Yeah, that is Amharic. Uh, it's a uh, Bantu language uh, from Africa. Uh, and that's the word for dog uh, in Amharic. It, do you see any resemblance between dog, perro, and uh, the word for dog in Amharic? Nope, completely arbitrary, right? So when sign is a symbol, it means that the form and the meaning are completely arbitrary, as is the case with most uh, languages or words in most languages, right? So the summary is that we started with a working definition of language as a system of signs. There are three types of signs. There's icons, there's index, and there's symbols. But then, we also have linguistic signs, right? 
such as words. Word is the simplistic form of sign in human language, right? So for example, in uh, English, you have simple words and you have complex words. A simple word is a word that is created with just one morpheme. And a complex word in English is created with two different morphemes. So I have given you the example of sea and seashell. Sea is a simple word. It's only one morpheme right? The morpheme has a meaning associated with it. So you have a form and you have a meaning and you can connect the form with the meaning. But then you can take C and you can take shell and put it together and create a complex word, seashell, right? So the difference between C and seashell is in the number of morphemes. So this is a new vocabulary. It's a new concept. If you have not taken a linguistics class with me, this is uh, going to be completely new. If you have not taken any linguistic class before, it's going to be completely new. Um, I know that there are people in here who have taken linguistic classes before. So, you know, for you, uh, all of you, it's not going to be a new term, but the morpheme is the smallest unit of, of meaning, right? So that, that's the definition of a morpheme. The smallest unit of meaning in language is a morpheme. So in English, you can isolate all the different number of morphemes that English can have. You can do the same thing for Spanish. You can do the same thing for Amharic. You can do the same thing for any of the languages. Any language has morphemes, n number of morphemes, and these are the smallest units of meaning. So here are some examples of morphemes in English. So you have un, happy, and li, right? Unhappily, right? I've just broken down and deconstructed that word for you. There are three morphemes in unhappily. Un is the prefix, happy is the root word, and li is the suffix. And then you can have ness, right? Uh, you can say um, happiness. Uh, re is a prefix, red is a root. So you can see that these are all different kinds of morphemes in English. So you can create unhappy, unhappily, happiness, redness, etc., uh, from the set of morphemes that I've given you. Right? And you can create other words too, but th this is just a set of words that you can create um, with these morphemes. So what kind of signs are morphemes? Are they iconic? Are they symbolic? Or are they um, indexical? Right? So Usually when you talk about symbolic uh, signs, it's completely arbitrary, right? There's absolutely no association with the form and meaning. And usually morphemes and language are an example of symbolic uh, signs, right? So uh, for example, it's completely arbitrary that the word for dog is dog, right? I mean, why couldn't we call dog ice cream, right? I mean, we could have, right? There's nothing stopping us from doing that, right? So it's completely arbitrary why we decided to call dog with a d and a and a g, right? We will get into morphology in week four. So we will uh, talk a lot more about morphemes and how to identify morphemes, how to create your own morphemes in your constructed language in week four. Okay, so this was just like a, a sneak peek into morphology. Now, why are linguistic signs considered as symbolic? There are two reasons for this. The first one is that signs, we, we, we process signs at a really quick rate. I said this, right? When I speak, you are processing this, your, your brain is understanding this really quickly, right? So we are processing these symbolic linguistic signs at a very, very fast rate. Okay, two or three signs per second. That, that's how quickly your brain is actually processing uh, these signs. And the second one is that most of these uh, signs actually don't have vocalizable sounds. Okay, so they do not have any formal iconic or indexical properties and they cannot be vocalized uh, in sounds. The last evidence uh, for why uh, linguistic signs are symbolic in nature is because of translational equivalence. Okay, now we looked at dog, we looked at pero, we looked at uh, the word for Amharic, uh, the word for dog in Amharic. Now they all mean dog, right? But the sound systems or the sounds that are chosen by each of these different languages are completely different and completely arbitrary. The words don't look the same and they don't sound the same, 
right? English does not even have the sound, the, the R sound, the R, right? English does not even have that sound. So there are completely no translational equivalents in terms of the sound systems, in terms of the signs themselves. Only the meaning is the same. They all mean dog, right? But they just don't look the same, right? They don't look the same. They, they don't have the same sound systems. And when you look at synonyms, uh, for example, um, so here are some synonyms from uh, English. So sick means the same as ill. Uh, 12 means the same as uh, dozen, right? So if morphemes were not symbolic, but they were iconic or indexical, then we shouldn't be expecting synonyms, right? Synonyms are a feature of the symbolic nature of linguistic science. You can have different words that map on to the same meaning, right? Being sick, being ill, same meaning, but different forms, right? 12 and dozen, same meaning, different forms, okay? And if, if you have iconically expressible meanings, then we should have seen, for example, uh, two should be twice as big as the form of one, but it's not. One and two have the same length, O-N-E-T-W-O, -E right? It, it's not iconic in any way. Narrow should be narrower than the word for wide, but it's not, it's in fact the opposite. Right. So if you uh, think of morphemes as indexical or iconic, then you need to have those physical qualities expressed in the pronunciation of that particular word, in the representation of that particular word. But we actually don't see that. But the, the classic thing about language, uh, especially English, is that there's always exceptions to the rule. Right, and it, there's also exceptions for this case. Uh, some of the exceptions for iconic and indexical linguistic signs are mimetic words. Okay, uh, have you heard of mimetic words before? Have you? I mean, you you all know what mimetic words are. Mimetic words are words that sound like what they mean, such as bow bow and tick tock and bam, etc. They're also called as onomatopoeic words. So mimetic, mimetic is the word that I'm using here, and onomatopoeic might be, you know, a word that you're familiar with. Um, maybe you've heard of this word in English 101 or one of your English classes. So here are a list of uh, mimetic or onomatopoeic words across languages. So the question to ask is, do all dogs bark the same way in different languages? And the answer seems to be no, right? So how does uh, dog owners in the class, how does your dog bark? Because I know there's a lot of variability even just within you know, dogs barking in the US. Is Landon looking at, do you have a dog at the back? That, oh, okay. Yeah, my dog is on my bed sleeping. You can kind of see the little white poking out there. Um, she doesn't bark, she goes, oh. <laughs> okay, what is, is that a meaning associated with that or? Um, that means pay attention to me. <laughs> <laughs> Stop what you're doing. Pay attention to me. Yes. Anybody else? What, what, what sound does your dog make? Trinity here. Um, my dog doesn't so much bark as she just kind of huffs at people. So she just goes, huh, huh. Okay. And is there a meaning associated with that or? She just likes to make noise. Okay. There's no reason. Okay. Anybody else? Any other dog owner? Okay, so well, the, the, it, according to this um, graphic, it says English dogs go woof, okay? I've actually not heard a single dog go woof in America, to be very honest with you, but that's, that's what this graphic says. It says woof, uh, and then Russian is gav, and French is, I think that goes wow, something like that, right? Like Landon, <laughs> something simpler to what your dog says, I think. Spanish is gau, uh, Dutch is blaf, Japanese is wan, Icelandic is woof, that's similar to the English, as you can see. Romanian is ham, Italian is bow, Cantonese is wong, Turkish is hev, Persian is hop, Indonesian is guk, 
and Korean is mong, mong, I think that's how you say it. So, uh, you know, it, I don't know the truth of this. I thought it was fun. It sparked a lot of discussion when I showed it in class. Um, but, you know, again, another potential research topic, if some of you are interested to research how uh, dogs sound in different languages, if you're a cat person, how cats sound in different languages, you know? Um, so I'm gonna leave you uh, with that because I know that we are only two minutes from 10.30, but is there any questions about any of the material that I've covered today in class? All right. Well, um, then uh, I'm, I'm gonna, like I said, I'm gonna get off Zoom and you can all go off Zoom, but you need to finish the questionnaire in the next 15 minutes. So uh, it's in your email. Uh, so feel free to do that right now. And I will see you all on next Tuesday. All right, sounds good. Have a good weekend. Bye.